Well, thanks guys for, for being here. Thanks for, for having me. Uh, this is something that I think is super important. I think it's fascinating, uh, not only from a PT and a medical healthcare standpoint, but just from a societal standpoint in general. Uh, so we're going to talk a bit about social determinants of health and kind of how that plays into some of these social disparities and, and accessibility of care and all those, all those things. Uh, and like Tian said, feel free to throw comments, questions in the chat bar throughout. Uh, I can't really see them. Uh, because I'm sharing my screen, but we'll get to those kind of towards the end. We'll open it up for, for questions here. But here are the objectives of this presentation. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to identify what some of those uh, contributors of health, of health status are, uh, recognize social determinants, understand how they can affect pain and well-being, learn how to, a little bit of how, how to assess those social determinants, and then how to implement some of those biopsychosocial principles uh, and some of those social determinants of health into clinical practice so that we can address those things. So what I want to start with here is that here is a list, and this is by no means comprehensive, but these are the most common things that we think of when we, when we think about social determinants of health. We think of social support systems, uh, we think of geographic locations, uh, socioeconomic status, education level, access to health care, quality of health care, um, access to clean food and water, access to decent jobs and jobs that you don't hate, uh, genetics, and then um, racial and ethnic differences between, between people. Um, and what we see in some of the research is that, you know, immigrants, not just dictated by race, but just immigration status tend to uh, utilize higher healthcare dollars. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that, and that I want to point out, because I just, I find it a really interesting fact is that uh, what you are, what makes you the most likely to uh, undergo a spinal fusion surgery has nothing to do with your symptoms, duration of symptoms, intensity of symptoms, location of symptoms, none of that. Uh, it has more to do, it's more predictive um, by your zip code. So where you are in the country predicts whether or not you're going to have or more likely to have a spinal fusion surgery than anything else. So we see that not only by where you live um, determines some of your social determinants, but also the, the kind of healthcare that you can expect to get. And it's also uh, social determinants are super expensive, right? So the, the losses, the annual economic losses from social determinants, and we'll talk about the actual number here in a moment, but it's equivalent to 2.45 million DPT degrees from Midwestern University, one and a quarter million homes in, uh, in Glendale, Arizona, with the average cost in Glendale being about 250,000, and then 412 million iPhones. So uh, I don't know why we would need 412 million iPhones, but just in case you wanted that for reference of what your iPhone costs, you can buy 412 million of them for the amount of money that we lose in healthcare disparities uh, and social determinants of health every year. So this is a, a chart. And, and so this is just a, a graphic that I think is really interesting again, because we see uh, the OECD, which is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and, and out of all of the countries in the OECD, of which this is not an exhaustive list, but these are the highest, I think there's 11 here. These are the highest um, percentage of, of GDP and, and what health, what percent healthcare dollars are, are accountable to that, so, or accounted to each of those things. So we see that, you know, all of these, Switzerland is the highest with about 12.2% of their GDP that's spent on healthcare. And the U.S. is at almost 17% despite the fact that that's such a massive amount of our GDP, we also have among the OECD nations pretty much the lowest uh, healthcare outcomes. So that, you know, we're maybe not doing, doing the best job and we need to rethink the way that we uh, not only assess, but, but deliver healthcare. So a little background of what specifically social determinants are. They're non-medical factors. They can influence physical and mental health and those health-related outcomes. They're defined as the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, age, and the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. So, uh, you know, these are going to be varying widely depending on where you are, where you come from, um, you know, those, some of those other background pieces of, of jobs, of socioeconomic backgrounds, education levels, those types of things. But they're primarily rooted in resource allocation at the local, national, and global levels. And we'll talk about towards the end a bit why this is really important that we recognize the local, national, and global implications of, of the social determinants of health and kind of some of the things that we can do um, to address that. But social determinants of health are responsible for the majority of health inequalities 
Uh, and so we really need to be aware of the patients that we're treating, uh, the patients that we're not treating also, and why those patients that we're not treating who we could be treating probably recognize why we're not treating them. So research really began on social determinants when it was deemed critical towards the end of the 20th century around the 80, 1980s with the onset of HIV and AIDS um, during that epidemic. However, it really started, we started to see this, it became apparent uh, back in the civil rights movement when um, Dr. Martin Luther King and, and a lot of those other civil rights activists were traveling to various places across the country, particularly in the South, and were seeing the people uh, the living conditions of the people that they were, were trying to help. And so they would travel to all of these different locations and, and see these people were living without running water. These people were, were living without functioning toilets. Um, they didn't have any sort of access. They had to walk miles and they had no bus transportation or anything like that to get you know, anything that resembled decent food or, or water. Uh, and, and so this has really been going on for, for the better part almost now of a century. Um, when, we, when we really look at it that way. But the research back in the 80s and, and, and early 90s was eventually really deferred because they said, well, you know what? This isn't a government problem. This isn't a societal problem. This is an individual problem. And you need to take responsibility for your own health, which is really hard to do if you don't have access to clean water. Look at Flint, Michigan, and some of those issues that, that you may be seen up in there with their water supply. That's been a huge issue, not only from just a uh, you know, do people have running water, but do people have clean water that they can drink uh, that won't make them sick or kill them? So healthcare inequalities account for $309 billion in economic losses uh, annually, and they're disproportionately affecting disadvantaged populations. So minority uh, populations, low so socioeconomic status populations, um, low education populations, low education levels. Um, so we're seeing that consistently. And again, the, there are 30 nations that, that make up the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and the U.S. is near the bottom or at the bottom on almost every uh, standard measure of health status. So it's something that we really as a, as a country need to do a lot better in. And you guys can see this graphic here, too, where we see that chronic pain annual, annual cost is $635 billion a year. And that's how much it costs to treat cancer, heart disease, and diabetes combined. So a lot of money is lost through, through some of these things. And we can prevent, potentially prevent chronic pain by starting to address some of these healthcare disparities. And roughly 835,000 deaths are related annually to social determinants. And for, for frame of reference, you know, about 500,000 people within the last year have died of COVID-19. Um, so roughly half of, of the number of people who die from social determinants of health annually. And you guys, if you guys follow kind of the, the stimulus package and some of those things and the economic relief that's happened uh, through federal legislation, there's been a lot of money pumped into it. And, and, and that's, that's a good thing, right? We, we need that. We need people to be healthy um, because if we don't do that, then we start to, to end up funneling more people into these disadvantaged populations, uh, which then leads to that further gap in what's already a very wide gap in, in social determinants uh, of health. But we see social determinants that, that really play a role in that as low education, racial segregation, which you know oftentimes people argue doesn't exist anymore, and it absolutely does. Um, we see this with, with our, our maps of our population maps, um, and especially our, our poverty maps and, and relating that to race and ethnicities. Uh, low social support, uh, which is similar to the number of deaths of people who die from lung cancer, uh, and poverty and inequality, all of those things um, for social determinants of health uh, relate to about 835,000 deaths annually. And another thing to just keep in mind too, as far as racial segregation is concerned, is that when we look at the numbers of, of white versus black people, black people tend to live about six to seven years less on average than white counterparts. And so again, when we look at maybe racial segregation, we think about, um, accessibility to clean water, uh, food, quality health care, things like that. So that's where those things do still very much matter. Another thing that we look at is that 65 to 75, 74 year old age group has significant death rate decline of preventable death rates um, relative to younger populations. 
And one of the, the hypotheses of why this is the case is that what happens when we turn 65, Medicare kicks in. So we get that health care coverage, that comprehensive health care coverage, uh, which includes not only just the health insurance, but, but access to preventative screenings as well. Um, so you know, if you want to make an argument for, for health care reform, that's, this statistic is, is very much uh, a, a strong piece of that, that we're seeing a significant reduction in preventable death rates in that older population as they hit Medicare age versus younger populations. So as far as pain is concerned and kind of physical therapy related uh, impairments and issues, pain associated psychosocial issues can negatively affect health outcomes. That much we know that is proven time and time again in the research um, that those psychosocial factors um, influence pain, it predicts disability, um, and, and it also predicts healthcare utilization. Those who score um, worse uh, on those psychosocial uh, aspects of care um, that they, they tend to use more healthcare dollars uh, for musculoskeletal related pain, even though it might not be entirely MSK related pain. And we also know that these psychological or psychosocial factors oftentimes are more predictive of, uh, of uh, changes in pain, functional outcome improvements, disability, the amount of medical visits and healthcare utilization than actual physical impairment. So while we might be out in the clinic, and this is where it's hard for us as PTs, right? You guys go through, through PT school, you learn how to measure all these different ranges of motion, learn how to test all these muscles, muscle length, muscle strength, uh, do all these special tests, which are not really all that special most of the time, but are, are part of our exam procedures. And then it's, it's like, well, they don't actually maybe matter that much. Maybe what matters more is looking at people's perceptions of their, of their pain, uh, how they view the world, how they, what their social system looks like, uh, so we really need to start thinking upstream outside of the clinic. And, and so some of the questions that we should be asking our patients are, you know, how are you? Not just how are your symptoms, but how are you? How are the things going in your life? How's your, how are your stress levels? How are you sleeping? How's your nutrition? Um, those types of things are really things that we need to address. And then from a, from a societal standpoint, we need to start thinking upstream a little bit more and funding some of these things. We'll talk about that a bit more later too. So back in, in 2014, the poverty rate was about 15% overall. Now it's down, uh, in 2018, it was down to 11.8%. Uh, and the next slide will show that it's down a little bit even further. Uh, but individuals living in poverty areas has increased from 49.5 million in 2000 to 77.4 million um, from 2008 to 2012. So while there's an eight to 12 year difference there, and so we've certainly seen an growth within the country within that time to see almost 30 million more people in poverty areas and poverty neighborhoods is unusual. Uh, so despite, and that's despite poverty rates, percentages going down. So we're seeing a, a more concentrated area of, of poverty now. And we also know that with those poverty areas, typically we see uh, lower quality of education, again, less access to all of these social determinants that we'll, we'll talk about a bit in, in a couple of slides. Uh, but we know that there's a significant association between education and socioeconomic status. And so when we look at these poverty levels that have, in these poverty areas that have low uh, quality of education, these people are, who are living in those areas are oftentimes going to have a really hard time vaulting out of a low socioeconomic status uh, position. So this was in, in 2020, the, uh, the 2020 report for 2019 poverty rates. So in, in 2019, the last full reported year that we have with all the income tax and all that stuff was 10.5%. So the poverty rate dropped a little bit more. But what's interesting is the breakdown of the poverty rate. So white population is about 9.1%, Asian population is about 7.3% poverty, and then Hispanic and black populations at 15.7 and 18.8%. Now, I'm no mathematician, um, but I do do dabble in statistics and, and statistically significant findings. And I would imagine that if we plugged all of these numbers into a, an SPSS software or, or like system and did a comparison, that there would be a significant, uh, very significant difference between these two uh, when the black population and Hispanic population are almost double the poverty rates of the white population. 
So these impoverished neighborhoods will often have uh, a lack of access and accessibility to quality foods and water, like I said, adequate transportation, bus lines, train systems, things like that. Um, if they don't have, and oftentimes they don't because they're, they're living in an impoverished neighborhood for a reason, they don't have their own vehicle or they have unreliable, an unreliable vehicle. They oftentimes don't have uh, safe public spaces such as parks uh, for them to, to be at, uh, both from a mental and physical health side of things. It's difficult to find quality and safe job prospects, and they have poor quality and underfunded schools, and then they often don't have accessibility to healthcare services. And we'll talk a little bit about what accessibility to healthcare services is, um, but that's both in quantity and in quality. So the lack of access to all of these things really has to be considered when we're working with our patients in a clinical setting. And, and just for some, some easy to, to picture examples, think about uh, somebody who's working, who's in an impoverished neighborhood, they're working multiple jobs. Uh, so they're working 6 a.m. to 7 or 8 p.m. or maybe to 10 p.m. And they're doing that three, four, five days a week or more oftentimes. And so when are they going to come to PT, right? So it's not just an accessibility of, of getting to PT, but do they have the time to get to PT? Because if they miss a shift, now all of a sudden, you know, this bill doesn't get paid or food doesn't get on the table for, for kids or, or family, uh, those types of things. And then thinking about what can they do for their home exercise program? Where can they do it? Maybe they don't really have uh, a wonderful home life. Maybe they don't have, if, if we're, uh, one of the things that I tell my patients to do oftentimes is get out and walk. So, hey, I want you, you've got low back pain. Let's start a walking program. You're you know, 20, 30 minutes or more a day. Uh, get outside, go up and down hills, do that kind of stuff. Well, if they live in a neighborhood and they work long hours and they don't get to go outside until it's dark out, now you you change the dynamic, right? They're not going to be able to get out because they're not comfortable going outside after dark um, because they live in a, in a place where there's high crime rates and violence and those types of things. So we need to, to look at some of the other pieces here in lower education level and higher proportion of, of uh, in, so this is in COVID-19 patients now. So this was um, especially back in the beginning of this, when the research was really coming out, this started to become a point of interest that lower education levels and higher proportions of black residents um, were at greater risk for contraction of COVID and death of co from COVID amongst both severely and less stressed communities. And so these were stressed um, economically, um, uh, psychosocially, those types of, of, of measures there. They also saw that poverty and unemployment were protective against COVID-19 contraction and death to some extent. And the reason for that, kind of the hypothesis again, is that uh, they were often at decreased risk for exposure because they were working less or, or not at all. Uh, they were less socially active and they had fewer, so therefore they had fewer opportunities for exposure. Um, and, and so now obviously we've seen a higher, uh, kind of some of those lower, uh, lower totem pole jobs, those lower skilled jobs become a little bit more readily available, though a lot of them are still, still not where they, uh, where they had been prior to the pandemic. So we're still seeing a lot of these people out of work for an extended period of time, uh, becoming less of their risk. So again, just kind of on a, on a COVID kick here, when we look at the differences between um, white, Hispanic, black populations, and then uh, Native American populations, we can see that these, these cases are death rates and these are reported from the CDC. And so the cases amongst, um, amongst black individuals, really not that much different uh, as far as the contraction rates. However, hospitalization and death were triple and double. Right, so that's a significant difference. So we start to think of, about why are those so significantly worse? Same thing we look at Hispanic and Latino populations, uh, not that much worse in terms of contraction rates, but significantly worse triple and double again at uh, hospitalization and death rates and, and similar numbers for, for Native American populations. So why would that be? Uh, and, and we look at those are you know, poverty rates again, um, location, access to, to quality care, those types of things. Um, that's, that's really what we're looking at with something like this. We have to kind of think about why that might be the case uh, and not just, not just kind of push it off and say, well, there are differences. 
there really aren't that many differences for how these um, tend to manifest, although they, they have um, hit these other minority populations significantly harder oftentimes. And, and a lot of that, again, I think is probably poverty rates uh, and some of those other social determinants. So accessibility, when we look at about, when we look at accessibility, we're not talking just about quality, physical healthcare sites. We're talking about access to information, um, and we see this with this digital divide. So these, these prospective potential patients don't even have access to, to the internet. They can't even look at WebMD or go on and do a PubMed or, or NAI, uh, NIH search um, because they don't have access to, to the internet, right? And so we see this, again, disproportionately in Black and Hispanic households uh, that they don't have internet access or they don't have quality, reliable internet access. Um, which becomes a potential issue with things like telehealth. Um, and we see these low income households, which are four times more likely to lack high speed internet uh, than, than high and medium or medium and high income households. So there is a significant disparity here between, um, again, race, not only racial and ethnic backgrounds, but also socioeconomic backgrounds and how those people can get that information. Because not only are they oftentimes not able to get to physical sites, but then they can't even figure out and go on YouTube and try to, to treat their own back or things like that. Again, they're unable to access some of these, these, uh, these pieces of information like our health related services, which could be telehealth um, or maybe patient portals that medical offices might use on their websites. They're not able to interact with physicians that way. You guys, if you guys have ever tried to call a physician office and actually speak to a physician, uh, even from a healthcare standpoint from, you know, hey, I'm calling about your patient. Uh, because I think your patient has these massive red flags, it's still almost impossible to get them to call you back. So as a patient, to try to get them to call you back on something that they might not see as urgent is oftentimes really challenging. Um, emergency assistance, right? If you live uh, out kind of uh, away from, from the, the hubs of where the hospital might be, you might have a really hard time getting an ambulance to, to come and get you um, or, or to, to get any sort of emergency services. Employment opportunities, think about how you guys uh, apply for jobs now. It's not the hit the, hit the bricks, hit the pavement and go, go in and ask to speak to a manager and, and get, a, get a paper application. No, you're filling everything out online, right? Um, so online applications, and if you don't have high speed internet, that becomes, a, that becomes a problem or access to internet becomes a problem. Um, if you don't have transportation or reliable transportation or there's poor public transportation in your area, how are you getting to work, to and from work? Uh, you know, you guys might see some of these stories periodically about you know, this guy who walks five miles one way to work, gets up, you know, three hours before his shifts and walks into work and walk, you know, walks three miles or three hours back, right? It's, it's, we see this stuff, um, it's out there. And then homework for children. I think you guys have probably been, you guys have seen, you guys aren't children, um, obviously, but your, your, your learning experience, your educational experience has changed demonstrably, especially over the last year as we've shifted from this traditionally you know, brick and mortar, live and in-person lecture and uh, lab type thing to, hey, we're gonna do a lot of these lectures online. Uh, probably in the past, if we were to do something like this, it would be in person. I'd be standing in front of a bunch of people and instead I'm sitting at my computer desk uh, in my office. I'd much rather be in front of you guys and, and interacting personally. But we see this, um, you know, if, if students, if, if children don't have access to high-speed internet, they're not able to get to their classes, they're not able to get to, um, their homework in, and then education suffers, and then we get this snowball effect into socioeconomic status, which becomes problematic. Because what we see is that those who have poor access to quality health and lifestyle options are at greater risk typically for obesity, uh, nicotine, and, and alcohol dependence, as well as potentially opioid dependence. Uh, and then depressive and anxiety disorders. And what we know about all of those things is that they tend to lead to higher healthcare utilization uh, and costs uh, and worse health outcomes. You know, think about your patients who are, are, have been smokers for 30 years and get a rotator cuff surgery, pathologic or um, pathophysiologically, how are they gonna heal? Right? They're gonna heal a lot slower than their counterpart who doesn't smoke and has been active and healthy and isn't overweight um, and, and has quality, uh, has good mental health on positive outlooks and social support. Those people do much better than the ones who are uh, obese, uh, nicotine, alcohol dependent, and have poor social support. 
So wh why does it matter, right? We've got a lot of reasons why it matters, but but really for us as PTs, it's we are we are really uniquely positioned as as potential primary healthcare providers, um, and, and as we get more and more into that direct access piece, to address some of these biopsychosocial barriers. Um, have a multimodal treatment approach, utilizing other providers as we need to. I always tell people, look, if you don't have a if you don't have a psychologist that you refer to or a behavioral health specialist that you refer to, you have to get one. Uh, it doesn't have to be your behavioral health specialist, which I strongly encourage everybody to have uh, their own their own therapist. But if you don't have one that you can refer to, because uh, we have to have the awareness, we have to be able to identify these patients, and then we need to be able to get them the help that they need through other healthcare providers. Because if we want direct access as, as clinicians, which we should have, we should be primary healthcare providers from a musculoskeletal, neuromusculoskeletal standpoint. We also need to identify these barriers, identify red flags, and then figure out who the most appropriate person is to see them. Because we're seeing these people, we're seeing these, and it's not just at the evaluation too, I wanna to point that out. We're seeing these people for 30 to 60 minutes. We're seeing them one to three times every week for X amount of weeks, right? We're seeing these people for usually probably anywhere from like six to 20 visits. So if we see people for that long, we should be able to identify these things. We should be able to pick up on these things pretty, um, hopefully sooner rather than later. And, and one of the reasons being is that we see this in this chart can be a little bit confusing, I think, um, at least it is to me sometimes. It's a little, it's a little deceiving, maybe is a better word. So these are the number of people with musculoskeletal diseases by age. So in under 18, really not a huge change between 96 to 98 uh, to 2012 to 2014. But we see a little bit of change here in the 18 to 14, and then a significant increase, almost double at 45 to 64, and then about 10 million, 12 million more uh, at 65 and over. And there's a couple of reasons for that, right? One's probably, hey, we're seeing more people with, with health problems, comorbidities, and they're consistently living longer. And we also have we went from 276 million people in, in the late 90s in 1998 uh, to 319 million almost in uh, 2014. So, so we're seeing a big difference in the population, but that doesn't explain because there's a roughly 40 million uh, person gap there, but nearly a 30 million, roughly a 30 million person gap in this, right? So we're seeing basically everybody who was born or everybody who, who makes a difference in that population. Now, almost every single one of them has a musculoskeletal disease, um, which just we, we know just isn't, isn't the case that all the people who are born in that time frame now all of a sudden have this. Um, so we really just, we need to be aware that these, this is becoming far more common as we've also seen mental health issues become much more, uh, we've become much more aware of these things and they're hopefully um, over time gonna become less and less stigmatized as they've become a little bit over the recent years and we can start to address some of these things um, and part of the reason that why it's important for us as potential primary healthcare providers is if these numbers are increasing the way that they are, and we're seeing most of these patients, and hopefully some of them we're seeing as direct access healthcare providers, we also need to be, sc be screening not only for social determinants, but also for red flags. Red flag uh, or, or physicians or primary care providers, physicians, you know, uh, NPs, um, PAs, those people are routinely screening for red flags less than 5% of the time. And if they're screening for red flags, something that could potentially kill their patient less than 5% of the time, they're probably almost never assessing for social determinants and those other pieces, right? So that's really where it comes down to us being really good quality healthcare, a direct access primary healthcare providers, because we're gonna see a lot of these patients. Now, back when, I initially did, and I've modified this presentation for, for this, but I did this presentation about a year ago. And back then I, and I, I pulled, and I've talked to multiple people since, but I pulled a bunch of people and I consistently pull them at con ed courses and things like that, that I teach because I'm curious about people's beliefs. And multiple people that I, that I pulled believe that social determinants of health have a really low impact and that healthcare and quality of healthcare has a really high impact on patient outcomes. Now, this is premature death, but I think it gets the point across. That 90% of, uh, of, of what's contributing to premature death is related to behavior and social factors. However, healthcare receives by far the greatest amount of resource allocation. 
even though it only contributes 10% of, of the, the premature death proportion there. I think we really need to reconsider how our money is being spent, put more into social programs, help get people out of poverty, help get people educated, help give people access to quality uh, food, water, uh, job opportunities. And then if we do that, while it might be a cost on the front end, we've shown through, through various research that the predictions are that it ultimately reduces healthcare expenditure significantly. And we all saw the graph towards the beginning, right? How much more we spend on our GDP uh, than any other country at uh, almost 17%. So for us as PTs, again, we have to assess for modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. We see some of these non-modifiable risk factors up in the top right. Uh, and then we have to think about the modifiable ones, which things like weight, activity levels, uh, lifestyle behaviors, nicotine and alcohol consumption, nutrition, sleep. Sleep is a big one that has been uh, present in the research. Uh, recently, we have uh, some of my colleagues at, at Bellin College have, have been studying sleep pretty extensively. And what we find with sleep is that not only can pain negatively impact sleep, but lack of sleep can negatively influence pain, right? So it's not just a, a one-off cycle. It's this causes this, but this can also cause this. So then we end up with that vicious cycle of we're not sleeping well because we're in pain, and then we're not sleeping well, so we, we increase our pain. Uh, so, so we really need to assess for these risk factors to assist with our prognostic abilities and our development of our treatment strategies for these patients. And this is where that biopsychosocial model here becomes really critical. So how do we assess for this? Well, in the clinic, when we're, when we're working with patients just, and we might not be fully aware yet of where they fall within this, uh, this kind of continuum of social determinants, uh, we might not realize if they have anything at all, but we start to assess maybe some of these yellow flag components and some of these other psychosocial components so the arebromusculoskeletal pain questionnaire uh, is something that's really useful that, that is a nonspecific to a, any sort of diagnosis or body region, but looks at um, some of those psychosocial factors and fear avoidance, pain catastrophization, things like that. They're looking at pain perceptions. So the start back screening tool, which is kind of a risk stratification tool that looks at, okay, based on these responses, this person is a low risk, moderate risk, or high risk for recurrence or, or um, trending into chronicity on persistent pain. Then the Osprey yellow flag is another uh, tool that's a really great tool. And that's, a, that's a an offshoot of the Osprey red flag tool that was uh, developed um, back in 2016. And I think the red flag, the yellow flag was in 2017, 2018, if I remember correctly, maybe it was 2015 for the red flag. But anyway, um, that also again assesses, all of these assess these yellow flag kind of biopsychosocial factors uh, and help predict where people are going to go based on belief systems, based on um, you know, depression, anxiety, mental health, uh, all those types of things that we're looking at that we don't necessarily, that we can't measure physically, right? That we have to find some other ways to measure and having patients fill out forms and, and chatting with them uh, will give us a better understanding of their risk and, and that stratification. So one of the things that we can use to assess social determinants specifically is, is the SIREN, Social Interventions Research and Evaluation Network. So this is, they've got a website. It's a, it's a wonderful website, tons of resources, um, tons of free resources on that website. So I strongly encourage you guys to check it out. Uh, but they have a ton of different tools on there that are available uh, that I'll show in a couple of slides. Um, they've got links to a bunch of research studies that have been published. Um, many of them are, have the, the free versions of them published. And if not, I probably have access to the articles. So you can just ask me if you find one that you don't have that you want. Um, but they primarily in, this, in, the, in these SIREN tools or the, the tools that are listed on the SIREN webpage primarily address six domains of, so, of uh, social determinants of health. And those domains are economic stability, education, social and community context, health and clinical care, neighborhood and physical environment, and then food. And so these should all kind of at this point, that should be pretty much review. We should be able to say, all right, we know that socioeconomic changes happen. We know that low, so that low education or poor education leads to potential economic instability or low socio socioeconomic status. Um, we look at healthcare again. Is, is that super important? No, but it does have its place. And it is important um, that, we, that we give them quality healthcare, especially early on, to try to prevent that progression to chronicity. 
Uh, and then we have to understand what their social lives look like, what their social support looks like, um, what their neighborhoods and communities look like, and then what their access to, to food and, and water and everything looks like. So these are, this is a list of a bunch of the screening tools that are listed on the SIREN page. Now, um, we, 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 don't, we won't go through all of these and we won't really go into detail on them too much, but the YCLS, your current life situation, uh, and the AHC, the Accountable Health Communities, um, is, is really great. They're really great tools um, that are free. They're easy to use. Um, they're really easy to find on the SIREN website. And they're just looking at financial stability. They're looking at health literacy. They're looking at, um, at you know, food security, all those types of things, right? They're, they're assessing kind of all the things that we've talked about so far. So if you've got a patient who you have legitimate concerns about, it's really might, it really might be beneficial to have them fill out either one of these forms. They're, they're fairly similar. I encourage you guys to take a look, but they're fairly similar just in their, um, their layout and, and the content that they're, that they're diving into. But we also, I should keep it, I should point out too, um, they're also, we, they might not be available in every language. So a lot of them are only available in English or, or are only available in English and Spanish or, you know, one or two languages. So just be aware of that, too, that that does absolutely influence who we're going to give that to. Um, because if they're not fluent or they're not uh, super comfortable in, in English, then that might not be a great thing for, for us to do is to give them uh, a, a bunch of forms or forms with a bunch of questions that they don't understand. So we, what, why, part of the reason why this stuff matters is because we want that direct access. We want to be able to see these people. We want to be able to identify these things. We want that direct access because we know that that early access to PT is associated with lower healthcare utilization, lower healthcare costs, uh, and higher patient satisfaction, and, and better overall long-term outcomes. So if we can get them early, address some of the, the modifiable factors, and maybe work with patients to address um, pieces or work within the non-modifiable factors, we can have these more positive long-term outcomes, reduce healthcare utilization, reduce healthcare dollars. Uh, and, and the nice thing about living in Arizona, for those of you who live in Arizona and intend to stay in Arizona, is Arizona has unrestricted direct access. Uh, so we should be, you know, over the next, well, it'll probably take another, you know, 50 years for us to really have direct access to the point that it, it's really clinically meaningful in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Um, but it's something that as you guys get out and you start practicing, if you're in a state with direct access, tell your patients, hey, just so you know, you don't, depending on their insurance, you don't need a referral to come back and see me. So if you have pain, if you have these issues, mobility deficits, these types of things, these are the things that we treat. Don't even go to your physician. Save yourself the trip. Save yourself the copay. Uh, save yourself the, the time and the time off of work and come in and see me first or call me and we'll see if it's an appropriate thing for me to see you first. Um, so, so we see this and not only direct access in, 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 uh, within the physical site, but even health, even direct access via telehealth, right? Um, that can really help rural communities and help accessibility within rural communities provided they have internet access. If we can get this more widespread internet access and get it uh, to, to those who might not have it, uh, then, then we can start to reach more people in a, in a more uh, advantageous way to lower cost utilization and improve patient satisfaction and outcomes. Because we know that the timing matters. If we see people earlier, before they've kind of gone into this over-medicalization, um, you know, I've had this pain for five years and my physician told me to just sit on it and not do anything, take ibuprofen, they prescribe me opioids, um, then that cascade happens and all of a sudden we, we've got these things that lead to tons and tons of healthcare dollars being spent, poorer outcomes, uh, and, and lower patient satisfaction. So if we see them early, we have lower opioid or fewer opioid prescriptions. We have less utilization of imaging, uh, which oftentimes is unnecessary unless a patient really is considering uh, undergoing surgery or is having some other sort of um, issues neurologically, things like that. Uh, and we see fewer spinal injections as well. And, and those total costs can be $1,000 to $2,000 a year um, difference in early onset or, or early uh, access to care versus delayed access to care for low back pain specifically. So um, there was a request about prison PT. And I think we can probably all agree that oftentimes these, 
these patients, inmates, um, are, are often uh, of, of these lower socioeconomic classes, lower educated, less educated, those types of things. Um, and so not only would they have poor access to care you know, outside of a prison, but they also have really poor access to care within prison. There's very little actual peer reviewed literature that's out there. Um, there is a great podcast that one of my colleagues, Mark Shepard, um, who does with uh, an, an Evidence in Motion podcast did with Dr. Jess Feta, uh, who's a federal prison PT, and she kind of dives into some of her stuff. Um, but essentially, what it boils down to is PTs are direct access providers in prison. Um, they, are, they also work as, as potential physician extenders. Um, but there's limited resources. Really, they don't have, they've got minimal equipment, uh, minimal supplies. Uh, so they're really having to do a lot with very little. Um, again, we talked a little bit about the, the demographics, but prison PTs really have to tend to be skilled generalists, right? They're, they're an ortho PT, they're a neuro PT, they're, uh, they're a wound care specialist. They're doing all of these different things where uh, they're doing wheelchair fittings, they're treating people with chronic pain, they're treating people um, with, with, you know, prison fight injuries, things like that, um, acute fractures. They're, they're having to be this kind of jack of all trades, which, which is great in some ways, right? It keeps things uh, fresh from a PT standpoint, but from a quality of care standpoint, might not always be the best, the best scenario, um, especially if you, you know, look, I can, I can treat neurological patients and not kill them, but I'm certainly not the person that if you have a stroke, you don't, you don't want to come and see me. So don't ask, you know, if any of you guys have family members with a stroke, send them to Dr. Lapp. Don't, don't try to get me to see him. I'm, I'm, I'm not not in that uh, ball game. So again, the, just the quality of care really probably diminishes. And again, we don't have statistics that really support that. Um, that's just kind of logical, rational thinking, I think there. Uh, and again, they have an advanced scope of practice too, because they have all these responsibilities. So they can do certain things like, and the military PTs are similar, can, can prescribe basic medications such as NSAIDs. Uh, they can, uh, they can uh, request uh, basic imaging, uh, depending on, on what it's for and what it is. Uh, but any sort of MSK, you know, any sort of neuromusculoskeletal related problem, the PTC first. So in that sense, the prison system's great. Um, and it saves costs to, to the actual system. However, if you ever look at uh, prison PTs, the co-pays, uh, prisoners actually do have to pay copay, right? In West, West Virginia was one example. They make $6 a month. And their copay is five dollars a visit. So you do the math. That's really not. There's a, there's a disconnect there between what they're able to afford as far as quality of care or, or um, quantity of care is concerned, and then trying to figure that out. Um, you know, to 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 get the quality on top of the quantity that they need. Um, so so even though it's accessible in that they have PT prison or prison PTs, um, they're oftentimes really not able to, to look at uh, that as a viable option financially for some prisoners. So when we see patients, and this is not necessarily specific to, to social determinants of health, but this is really relevant to how we work with these patients. And we have to be a little bit extra sensitive about some of these things, extra aware of these things. We really have to make sure that we're establishing therapeutic alliance. Um, these soft skills are really, really important. Um, being able to communicate with a patient effectively, have quality interpersonal skills, be aware of the verbiage that we're using. We want to make sure that we're not, uh, if you guys have heard of the term, the, the, the term nocebo, right? We're not saying things, we're, not, we're using words that, hurt, that, that heal versus words that harm. Uh, we are giving really quality education to our patients. We're not uh, just saying, well, it, I'd rather focus on the exercise than actually educating my patient on what this stuff is about. Um, you know, sometimes in a, in a 30 minute treatment session, I might do 10 or 15 minutes of education, five minutes of manual therapy and 10 minutes of exercise. And there's still a lot that patients gain from that. Um, so just be aware of that because think about again, how much time we're spending with patients, 30 to 60 minutes typically. And physicians and, and general practice providers are usually probably five minutes or less um, that they're spending on average with their patients. So we get the, the opportunity to develop these emotional connections with patients they learn to trust us and we can really get a glimpse into what their true barriers are and what uh, types of things that they need. 
that allows us the, the opportunity to, again, ask some of those difficult questions, even if we're not maybe able to do it on day one, but by establishing that therapeutic alliance, we set ourselves up for um, asking tough questions later on, but questions that they might eventually trust us enough to, to answer. Um, and we, we need to think about, too, are we culturally competent? And I got this, this weird idea as I was thinking about this um, a couple of, maybe a month or so ago, about us as PTs, you know, we're, we tend to, to value altruism and compassion and those, those values, those core values um, within the profession. But I would imagine that if we probably took a poll of, of clinicians and a poll of patients and said, how much do you think that you practice or how well do you think you practice culturally competent care? I would imagine that we probably rate ourselves really, really high and patients probably still rate us okay, but probably significantly, statistically, probably significantly lower. And so I think we, we need to just be aware that we might not always be as culturally competent as we think that we are. And, and especially thinking about this, right? Demographically, when, when we look at the, the data of APTA, now this is membership, so this isn't necessarily reflective of the PT profession as a whole, but I think it gives it probably a pretty good, pretty good idea of where we lie. Roughly 70% of our profession is, is female and almost 90% of our profession is white. Now that does not at all represent the actual demographics of the United States. So if you're out there as a, as a minority and you know, we have all these studies that look and see, all right, well, well, members of different racial and ethnic backgrounds tend to relate a little bit better or trust a little bit easier to members of their own racial or ethnic background. And so if we're of a different racial and ethnic background, we need to work really hard to make sure um, that, that we're building that, that therapeutic alliance, we're building that trust, we're building that connection because we have to, to, to remember that most of these people who are in these minority uh, patient groups are not seeing a provider that fits within their typical community. Uh, so it looks very different for them than it does for us. And just be aware of that. Um, so, so again, being aware of, of some of that cultural competency it really is going to be extremely beneficial because we know that traditional conventional PT interventions really only have at best a moderate effect size. So we need to find some ways to increase our effectiveness of our care, which means that we have to, instead of be reactive all the time as a healthcare system, we have to try to, to have some proactive um, prevention there. We want to get targeted uh, evidence-informed care, to factors that are modifiable and try to work within those non-modifiable risk factors uh, and, and strategize some ways for patients to still be successful within that, recognizing that those, exi those barriers exist. Uh, we want to try to stratify our patients as best we can uh, to try to improve our functional outcomes. And that's where things like the Arebro, the Start Back tool, the Osprey Yellow Flag can become uh, really useful. And then funnel to the most appropriate prov provider. Again, we're not always the most appropriate provider. And it's I, I've seen way too many PTs uh, including myself at many times in my professional life, where I say, well, I'm going to be the most compassionate, I'm going to be the most caring, I'm going to spend the most time with this person, so I'm the best person to treat them. It's not always the case. Uh, ego aside, send them to uh, some sort of psychologist, uh, send them to behavioral health, send them to, you know, back to a physician, wherever they might need to go. But we need to reduce the gap in health equity and health equity between socioeconomic classes. That much is very, very clear in the literature. And so this is going to require us to be involved in local, state, and national policy and legislation, which I'm going to get on a quick soapbox here in a moment. So what do we need? Um, we need better understanding of social determinants by all healthcare providers. We have to understand them. We have to uh, relay this information to physicians, to nurses, to uh, chiropractors, OTs, other PTs, um, all of those healthcare providers. We have to improve our, our communication. We have to develop a robust research agenda. And so that's, you know, I think as we look at whether it's cultural competence or, um, you know, accessibility of care and, and getting patients ideas as to why they're not accessing these things when they should be, uh, we need to really beef up our research in that area. We need to figure out which variables are most associated uh, with the increase in, or decrease in healthcare costs, utilization and, and improved outcomes. And then we need to increase funding at federal and local levels. We need to consider uh, health and community 
planning and development. So you have things like parks and you know, lighting and out in the community and things like that that allow people to feel safe in their communities. Um, so this is where, well, well, we'll talk about that in a moment. So social determinants, again, they vary really widely. Uh, they include race, genetics, education, socioeconomic status, education level, social support and location amongst many others. Health and pain issues are typically heterogeneous and multifactorial. So we can't just put people in a box and say, well, I've seen this before, so this is what we're gonna do, right? It's not just everybody's gonna respond different physically, everybody's gonna respond difficult, differently emotionally, psychologically. Um, they, there's, we need to, to keep that in mind and, and account for that and work with that with that at each particular patient. Every patient is their own case study, they're their own N of one. Uh, oftentimes these, these things are difficult to treat, especially when we have a lot of these confounding social determinants, psychosocial barriers. Uh, so we really need to collaborate not only with, with other healthcare providers, but make the patient an active participant, collaborate with them, develop that really good rapport. Um, we wanna stratify risk again as often as we can, give some, some outcome measures, use the SIREN tools, the, the, um, the YCLS and the, and the AHC to, to uh, assess those or any other ones that you might find that are pertinent to your patients. And then the other thing that we really wanna do, and, and again, I've talked to some of you guys about it, but I think that professional organization involvement is super important. Um, you know, we, we all, I think we all understand that we are accruing a significant amount of debt as students within the PT program. And then you're going to get out and I hate to break it to you guys, but you're not going to get paid that much. Uh, and you're not going to get paid nearly as much as you want and as much as you deserve. Right. So and everybody wants to, to whine and moan about it. And that's great. We can certainly do that kind of behind closed doors. But we need to, you know, California, let's talk just West Coast, California, uh, Washington, Oregon. None of those places are allowed to dry needle. Uh, at least two, if not all three of them are not allowed to do any spinal manipulation. There's ways to document around that, but you definitely can't document around dry needling. You either did it or you didn't. Um, but if we can be more involved as a professional organization, and that doesn't necessarily have to be in social determinants, it doesn't necessarily have to be about dry needling or, or spinal manipulation or anything like that, but just more involved, right? Advocating for our patients, advocating for our profession, direct access. You know, we again, we, we want to complain about Medicare cuts, but we don't do anything to actually fight the Medicare cuts aside from saying, well, I wish the APTA did more. Okay, well, let's let's be that change within the APTA, within our state, uh, our state chapter, um, within our within our local sections, and then within within the um, APTA uh, federally as a whole, because that's how you know we're going to reach some of those other more national federal changes and, and influence that is by by talking to those people. Uh, and making them aware of these things that they're not really even aware of, that we're still not really aware of. And so as we see these things and we become more um, accustomed to dealing with them, now we can go out and we can educate other people on them. So that's my quick soapbox on uh, professional involvement. Don't just because your employer, I get that it costs a couple hundred bucks a year, but as students, you guys get discounted rates and then hopefully your employer will pick up the bill. And if not, just pay for it, it's worth it, I promise. All right, I've got some references and then I'll open it up uh, let me check the chat here and just see what kind of questions that we have. Um, example of a difficult question. That's a great, that's a, that's a great question, Denise. Um, so difficult questions that we might have to ask are, you know, are you safe at home? Uh, those who we talk a little bit about it when we talk about uh, manual therapy, especially around the neck or some of the, the tests and measures that require us to be around the neck. Um, and, and so you, I've certainly worked with people who are victims of domestic abuse, although it's not I haven't, I haven't seen a lot of them that I have known for certain were victims of domestic abuse, but some people are just like, they, they get really squirmish, uh, squeamish when you kind of get around their neck area uh, that you, you really have to be aware of. Um, so things like that, are you, are you okay at home? Uh, things like, hey, you know, how are you doing financially? Uh, and and some, people, some people will be, you know, very upfront about some of that. You know, they have a $70 copay. Um, which was a part of a big part of the Affordable Care Act. Yeah, a lot of people got insurance, but people would come into my clinic with seventy dollars copays, and they're making minimum wage, which you know equates to about fifteen thousand dollars a year. So, you know, look at rent and all those types of things. That doesn't give you any money to spend. And so, patients would come in and and say, "Well, I I can't afford this. I can't afford this copay." Um, and, and we have that conversation of what can you do, uh, what works for you. Let me work with you. Email phone calls, things like that, where you might not come into the clinic, 
but I can still get you some of this information without seeing you as an official patient. So sometimes it does require us to go a little bit out of our way. Um, and then, and then as far as things that might, uh, you know, things that might offend people, again, we're asking them things like, Hey, how's your neighborhood? You know, are you, do you feel safe walking outside? Do you have, a, and, and so rather than framing it as, do you feel safe where you're, where you're outside? Just say, Hey, are you, are you comfortable going outside at night in, you know, where you live and doing some walking? If, if you have a job that typically takes you beyond daylight hours um, and, and things like that. So just trying to frame it in a way that's, um, I would say that most of the questions that we're asking st still aren't offensive, technically, but they can be a little bit sensitive. Um, and, and, and every patient's going to be a little bit different, especially when we're talking about mental health issues. Um, and those are really where it can be, you know, we're not going to come right out, out and ask you when we've had this conversation about cancer, right? You're not just going to say, have you had can do you have cancer, right? We, we, we try to find a way to ask it with a little bit more tact. Um, but saying things like, um, hey, you know, how have you been feeling? It sounds like you've had a really tough time with it, with this. Have you talked to anybody about this? Do you, do you have somebody that you can talk to, a healthcare provider? Um, have, you, have you had any of these types of symptoms? And we can do our, um, our depression screening questionnaires and stuff like that as a part of that, um, where, where we're asking our patients, hey, you know, are you, are, do you feel okay? How, how do you feel like you've been just mentally, emotionally? Uh, but asking in a way that's very compassionate instead of just, you know, Okay, how do you feel like you've been emotionally? Been okay? All right, great. All right, put your stuff down, get your computer out of the way, get your notes out of the way, look your patient in the eye, lean in, have those good body, those good, um, that good body language, and ask in a very compare, in a very caring and compassionate tone. I think that's the best way that we can manage those patients, whether it's a difficult thing about social determinants, psychological, um, you know, mental health issues, things like that. What other questions do we have? Anything? I know we went a little, Thank probably you. a little over. Um, I have a question. So, um, so one little quick one is uh, that you mentioned about the siren. Um, mm -hmm. Does the website also provide like resources uh, once they address kind of like the challenges that patients have? Maybe identify like financial uh, factor or some other factor and do they provide like resources? Okay, so now how do you address that kind of? A, a little bit, they do have a little bit of that. Primarily it's geared towards um, towards identification, but they definitely do have some resources that are out there um, that you know are more kind of well-known resources that you may be able to access um, from a patient side of things. Uh, it's It doesn't seem just navigating their website, it doesn't seem to be the focus um, it's more about identification uh, and what theoretically we could do, but they do have certainly some some um, pieces on there that could help with that. I see. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Um, yeah, I've got one. Um, so to back on topic with what Denise was saying, um, so after we bring up this like tactical question and we kind of get the patient to realize that their nutrition or maybe their behavioral choices are something that they should be looking into, how do we walk a line of being persuasive and like motivating the patient to like seek out this help? Maybe if they're not really on board with that, um, if you have any experience on that, I'd love to hear. <laughs> yeah. That. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a lot of our patients, right? I mean, and we think about, um, you know, think back to PT eval or, um, you know, the PT twos, we just had the, talked a little bit about, um, that model of change, that behavioral change kind of motivational interviewing. Um, if a patient isn't at a place where they're willing to make changes, it's really, really hard and, and not something that, you know, it's the, you can bring, you can bring the horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Right. Um, yeah. We, we, tr we can try, we can try our best and not to say that it's, it's futile in all cases. It's certainly not always a Sisyphean effort, but, um, we, we look at, at things that we can do and, and arguments that can be persuasive. So let's say, let's take, for instance, um, you know, sleep. Hey, how are you sleeping? Not great. Why? You know, what, when you say not great, are you not falling asleep? Well, are you, are you not sleeping through the night? Well, do you just have poor sleep? hygiene in general, you go to bed late, uh, intentionally, you're up playing video games till 2 a.m. And then you have to get up at, at you know, six to go to work. Uh, so you get four hours of sleep, right? That's, that's where we start to say, hey, look, here's, here's what we know about sleep and pain. 
and how this cycle happens. Um, and, and so I can't make you change your sleep pattern, but I can, I can ad advocate for a better sleep. You know, the more sleep that you get, the more restful sleep that you get, the more that this is going to recover, the less sensitive that your nervous system is going to be, the less pain that you will feel, those types of things. Uh, or nutrition, right? Let's say that somebody eats tons and tons and tons of fast food or junk food all the time. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they're, they're really overweight. They're really unhealthy. And then we can have the conversation of, Hey, look, um, we can try to do this through manual therapy and exercise, and we might make some changes, but also what we know is that, you know, roughly 75 to 90% of some of these changes are lifestyle uh, and social behavioral changes. And so, we can try these other things and see how they work. But if we hit a plateau, then what we might need to do is we might need to make some other lifestyle changes. Cause we do know that there is a, um, there's a link where, you know, we've got these, these foods that are high in sugar and some of these inflammatory components that increase the inflammatory process within the body and then set us up for, in, for an increase in pain. And so right. if we're not, if they're not willing to make that change at all, then that it's really hard to, to actually make lasting um, demonstrable changes. So um, those are some things that I think that we, we can do in some ways that we see that with some of those um, behavioral changes. Does that answer your question, Troy? Yeah, yeah. Um, tying it into like, we can work really well in the clinic and on the things that are like mostly within our scope. But if they're not willing to make changes out there, it's hard for us to even like point them in the right direction. Yep. Yeah. And, so, and so one of the things that I have with, with every one of my patients is, look, here's here are your, here are my expectations for me. You have your expectations for me. Yeah. Here are my expectations for you. These are the things that you have to do. And if you're not going to do that, then we're probably going to get stuck along the way. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're either going to listen to me and we're going to make further changes and progress and do better, or you're not going to listen to me. I'm going to kick you out. And so we have that conversation uh, up front. And again, I don't say it like that, but I just say, yeah. here are my expectations. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I need you to do. Here's what you have to do in order to be successful. Um, you said that I asked you what needed to happen for you to be successful um, and, and what a successful outcome looks like. Here's how we achieve that successful outcome. If you really want that successful outcome, this is what has to happen. Um, so that's how I approach that. Cool. Thank you so much for taking the time to present all this and answering my question. You are welcome. Uh, okay. Have you ever spent an, uh, yeah. Have I ever spent an entire appointment just talking to a patient? during a normal visit, no Therax, uh, mental health. And so, yeah, absolutely I have. Um, not that often, but it has happened from time to time where some patients just need somebody to listen and, and cry and talk about all of the horrible things that have happened as they've been uh, throughout this medical system. And it absolutely, you know, it, it absolutely happens. And as far as, um, you know, just again, listen, listen to those patients. And now all of a sudden you've got a patient for life, albeit maybe not a patient that you're going to love to treat all the time because they're very difficult, but they're also um, very rewarding patients at times as they start to see even small changes they're really grateful for. And it's, we, you know, we celebrate those small victories and it's really exciting when they have them. Um, as far as documentation, you're just going to, you're just going to document, um, you know, education. Um, this is what we talked about. These were strategies that we might have gone over. Uh, and, and these are the things that that we need to do going forward. Uh, so we're just we're just essentially then documenting the conversation that we have with the patient, not not verbatim, obviously, we're not typing out a transcript of our conversation, but the, the general themes of it. So you know, hey, we did some pain education, we did some um, some nutrition education, sleep education. You know, we we talked about um, you know changing to a, a low fat or a, a low sugar diet. We ch we talked about the importance of getting at least seven to nine hours of sleep every night. Um, patient verbalizes understanding and agreement, blah, 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 blah. So that's kind of how we're going to document that. And then billing, uh, it just depends on whatever, whatever your, um, your, your company, wherever you're working tends to bill for education. Uh, I will, if it's a part of therapeutic exercise, I'll just bill education with therapeutic exercise. If it's education about manual therapy and I've done manual therapy, I will bill it as part of that. If it's just kind of standalone education, I will typically bill it as therapeutic activity. Um, so that when um, they, when they go back and look at it, there's nothing, you know, again, because we're, what we're trying to talk about with, with the education piece is 
the is functional immediate changes that we can make in behavior. And that kind of falls under that, that therapeutic activity umbrella, I would say. Uh, but it's absolutely something that we can and should bill for. Um, Denise, a disconnect between the research and patient outreach and advocacy and what can we do? Um, again, I think a lot of that is just, ad, is just professional uh, involvement in professional organizations. Um, and, and I think the research is still in its relative infancy, which is why there's still a bit of a, of a disconnect. Um, and that and, it, and it, then it's, it's, it's expensive, right? And it's, and it's hard. Um, it, it requires effort and, and it's easier for, it's less work, even though it's more expensive, it's less work for us as a society and government to address these things. And, and this isn't even getting into any sort of political discussion, which you could have about this type of thing, um, unfortunately. But, you know, when we look at the funding, it's, again, it's easier to, to not put in some of those social programs that help to lift people out of those positions where they have to utilize these things more frequently. Um, and it's easier to just say, oh, it's your fault. It's your fault for being poor. It's your fault for living where you live. It's your fault for not eating healthy when in reality, um, they, they, they don't have money because they, they were poorly educated. Uh, they grew up poor. They didn't have those opportunities. They're not, they don't live near any um, decent employment opportunities. They don't live near a place where they can get decent uh, food or clean water. Um, they, don't, they don't have the means to move out of those places uh, because they're kind of stuck in that cycle, right? You, don't, you, you can't get a decent job, so you can't build up enough uh, financial security to move anywhere. And so I think that's part of why there's, there's a disconnect there. But I, again, I think just as new grads, being really, um, being really aware of, let me stop sharing my screen here too, being really aware of, of uh, our professional advocacy uh, and uh, involvement and what, that, what the potential is for us to make changes with that. All right, thank you, Dr. Subiaka, um, I believe our time's up. Um, thank you for a great presentation. Thank everyone yeah. for coming. Thanks for thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you for your, your questions. If anybody, uh, you know, I, I love this stuff. If anybody wants to um, chat about it more, you guys can feel free to shoot me an email. Um, we can we can meet. We can chat about it uh, in class. All that stuff. Um, so I'm I'm always here to. I mean, anything research oriented, I'm I'm always interested in talking about. So. Thanks. Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks for listening. And thanks for the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kubiaka.